Well, welcome. This is Chris Wolf of the Thomas International Center. Uh, we're having a panel discussion today on the great Southern Catholic author, novelist, Walker Percy. And we're fortunate to have here with us today Farrell O'Gorman, Peter Augustine Lawler, and Richard Reinch. So let me start off uh, asking a, uh, our panel a, a fairly broad question, I hope. Uh, I describe Percy as a great Southern Catholic novelist. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the, the different elements of that, you know, his greatness, his Southerness, and his uh, Catholicity, or what, what kind of bearing or impact they had on his, uh, his uh, artistic work? Let me start with, uh, with Farrell. Um, I think I'll, I'll start by addressing the, the Southern part. Um, Percy, uh, Percy's family had lived in the American South uh, on, on both sides for generations back. He was uh, inexorably marked by uh, growing up with extended family in Alabama and Mississippi and Louisiana. Um, and his family also came from uh, they were they were well off. They were politically involved in their region's affairs, uh, and had a kind of, of code of behavior, which was ultimately not Christian, uh, as Percy understood it and wrote about it in his essays. But communicated to him a sense of noblesse oblige, um, a sense of honor, which really provided a kind of uh, guidepost to him early in life in which he would always um, he would always understand as as foundational even as he came to see it insufficient later in life when he when he converted to Catholicism around the age of, of 30 um, it was in many ways in in reaction to that but also in constant dialogue with that um, with that code of manners and behavior in which his, his uncle, William Alexander Percy, who largely raised him in his teen years, um, had really communicated in particular Stoic philosophy, the writings of Epictetus and Marcus Aurelia, uh, Aurelius as a, uh, as a touchstone for Percy. So that's something about his Southern background. Um, and I think that, again, his Catholicism is well understood in relation to that background. Sure, other, there's all kinds of ways of looking at this. Percy's not a, a Southern writer in the sense that he's writing to defend the South. Uh, from Percy's point of view, Southern writing is the writing of a dispossessed aristocrat. So he says, before the Civil War, there was no Southern literature because all the literary uh, energy was taken up defending slavery. So it turns out the Southerners really were Stoics and Epicureans. You can look to the footnotes and all that but they didn't thematically reflect on their own experience. So after, after the Civil War, you have this kind of powerful literary moment of dispossessed aristocrats. So the, you know, when I first thought this, I went, you know, that may be the, the theoretical moment of the modern world, that uh, the other great dispossessed aristocrat is Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, he wrote the best book on democracy and the best book on America. So he could look back to aristocracy, but you know, his people were, like Percy's, dispossessed aristocrats, but they still had land and money, but they no longer ruled. And they could look forward to democracy so it could be, as, as much as Fox News used to be, fair and balanced uh, about this. So you could see the virtues of aristocracy and the virtues of democracy. So you could have this democratic criticism of aristocracy and this aristocratic uh, criticism of democracy. And, and Percy saw a lot of truth in the aristocratic criticism of democracy in the stoic criticism of democracy. For one thing, Uncle Will is, uh, the, the book he wrote, uh, Will, William Alexander Percy, the great poet, and, uh, and I use the word great not ironically, he was a, uh, a great writer. Lanterns on the Levee is a, a, an aristocratic book that's every bit as stoic uh, in depth as any book by the great Greeks and Romans. Uh, so, uh, and Percy knew that, you know, Will's criticism of modern materialistic capitalist consumerist America was, you know, there's a lot of uh, truth to it. So in, in Lost in the Cosmos, uh, uh, Percy's self-help book, you have this uh, funny thing, uh, interlude, uh, the last Phil Donahue show. 
Uh, I'm reluctant to bring this up because uh, none of the young people here today could have seen the uh, Phil Donahue show. Uh, but Phil Explain Don who Phil Donahue is. Phil Donahue is like the Oprah of his time, but not as classy. Uh, or, as, or as Walker Percy properly says, he started out classy, then he had added, got closer and closer to Jerry Springer as the ratings flagged. Uh, so, uh, so you have, uh, and then on, on the last Phil Donahue show, you had, you had, he had an expert uh, who knew all the studies, uh, a PhD in, in psychology, Dr. Joyce Friday, and she's modeled, of course, uh, you older folks know, on Dr. Joyce Brothers, who was the expert who was on Johnny Carson and all those shows uh, back in those days. And so they explain everything in terms of materialism, self-help, and, and all that. And, uh, and John uh, Calvin comes in from space, um, you know, uh, and then uh, and he he gives a Calvinist criticism of the idea of sexual preference. And then uh, Colonel John Pelham, uh, who fought with Jeb Stewart, comes in. And he gives this very elegant little stoic criticism of the way white trash treat women now. And everything he says is perfectly correct. And we Southerners know who we are and what we're supposed to do. We know who we're supposed to fight for. We know how to treat women. Uh, we know our place in the Edifian place. We know our place in, in, in the cosmos. Uh, and so it's this very fine little stoic talk. And so the you know the Stoics are right. They had class. They, they 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 knew who they were, and so Walker Percy couldn't have been who he was without that, because he's completely bought the Stoic criticism of white trash and their religion, that is evangelical religion, ah, uh, fundamentalist religion, and so that that kind of Christianity would never satisfy him. So if you think about it, uh, especially from the Appalachia, you have this great Appalachian. Uh, Christmas Carol, I Wonder as I Wander, uh, which could, Percy could have written a book uh, called that. Uh, so you, you have that basic Christian insight, but without any real self-consciousness from, from the evangelicals. So if you take evangelical Protestantism of the Christ-haunted South, add Stoicism to it, you really do, kind of, uh, the, the philosophy of the Greeks and Romans, you really do end up with Thomism, where you have a Thomistic, you, you have a a democratic criticism of the aristocratic vanity of the Stoics, which is also a Christian criticism, but then a Stoic criticism of the emptiness of modern consumerism, which is also a Christian criticism. So the Christians side with the Stoics on one side and the side with democracy on, on the other side. And Percy lived in this privileged moment where we could see we could see, we could see what was good about aristocracy and what was good about democracy. I was going to say, I think he is more of a philosopher, writer of the New South uh, in this regard. And I think, you know, it's interesting, we, we usually associate the New South with the post-war era, particularly the 60s, and the post-civil rights South, which kind of liberates the region. It becomes safe for commercial development. That picks up dramatically. The blacks now have civil rights. That's a good thing. Uh, it's worth, so there's something good going on in that regard. And yet he grows up uh, on a golf course in the 1920s in Birmingham. And, uh, someone uh, was relaying a conversation they had had with him uh, some time ago in which you know, he said, I'm not a Southern writer in the sense in which Flannery O'Connor was because I didn't grow up with it. You know, she grew up with it literally outside of her back door. Um, but what I did is I, you know, I, was, a, I was on a golf course. I was the son of a, a corporate lawyer. Uh, of course, now he has something that we've been discussing, uh, which is you know, this dramatic intervention of Will Percy after his father's death upon his life. Uh, so I think in that regard, he's, he is showing us a way to think about, I mean, it's where Peter's been talking about aristocracy and democracy, but something about the richness of the Southern heritage within, or as it confronts uh, the, the commercialized uh, capitalist uh, South and its uh, sort of increasing concern, or, or should we say increasing Americanism. I think, um, I also want to say there's, there's an interesting uh, quote, you know, uh, Percy uh, said something that, uh, to the effect, you know, northern writers, midwestern writers might be more commonly recognized uh, today, but really what they're doing, he's saying, is they're writing books about the books that Eudora Welty and, and, and William Faulkner wrote, and that is to say there is some inheritance from the South, there is still something thick, there's still some current of religion and belief that actually gives you a tradition to bounce against to relate to and, and to deal with in your own writing, and this is largely gone uh, from New England. So he, you know, he, he talked about, uh, you know, what's the worst that could happen to the South now is that we become 
uh, you know, money-grubbing uh, Yankees, but without their old pieties that we would see in, say, Herman Melville, uh, Hawthorne, and others, and we'll just be kind of like flat, like NASCAR, SEC. Uh, that'll be kind of like something, something that's kind of what, what the South becomes uh, known for. But I think just for clarity, SEC doesn't South refer to the Securities and Exchange Commission, but to the Southeastern Football Conference. Well, yeah, no, I, I, <laughs> the nation. <laughs> but I, you know, I think you know, fundamentally what's driving his writing. Of course, he had an essay on this where he seems to dispute the notion that he's a Southern Catholic novelist. To me, there is largely it's the existential question he's trying to ask, and, and really is. You know, what does it mean to be a human person in an age not only transformed by science, but an age where science wants to explain man qua man, uh, and how now should we think about ourselves, and how should we uh, relate to that and try and redeem, uh, I'll say, human dignity or man in the image of God. Uh, and so he's trying to find devices and narrative techniques within his novels that will do that in a, in a very memorable way that people can uh, latch on to. And, and I think he does that beautifully. It seems to me also the the southern parts in the novels are this attempt to use dialogue uh, in a way, particularly I, I, one of the ways that always sticks out to me, in loving the ruins of, uh, of kind of these decadent aspects uh, of American, modern American life and people coming to terms with that are gripping you know, with that and, and their relations with one another and showing, I think he's showing how empty things are, even within a, a commercialized South uh, that looks prosperous and stable, and yet there are there are all these sort of problems that are underneath. Once you start to peel back things, so in *Love in the Ruins*, in particular, you have uh, right you have a, the Christian evangelical private school, but which is formed by white flight. Um, you have, uh, of course, the, the, so everybody. This is kind of a part of their community. You have kind of a gated community, which is a part of the New South, but of course, a gated community is an attempt to have a political, social exit from the realm. You see all those sorts of things. Again, and that's where I see him largely. It's, it's there's an existential question uh, within the South, which is I think largely more of an American question about how now are we going to live. Yeah. Certainly, what he addresses is a is a universal condition, and yet it may be that his southernness might give him an entree into asking that question a bit more than perhaps somebody from a different part of the country. So. Uh, one thing that, that Walker Percy and Flannery O'Connor have in common is this, that they're both known to be rather you know, traditional you know, Roman Catholics, and yet when people come to do their reading for the first time, it's like, this isn't what I expected. I mean, this is not, doesn't look like Thomism to me. Uh, why, why do you think uh, per Percy writes the way he writes? Uh, uh, that's a good question. I mean, we could talk about literary models. Um, one really important model, literary model for Percy uh, was Dostoevsky, who was not Catholic, but uh, a very committed Orthodox writer. Uh, and uh, Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground, in particular, uh, with that, the first person narrator that you get in Notes from Underground, who's very attuned to shortcomings in modernity, um, modern Russia in, in his case, but I think that Percy's voice in his first person novels, I'm thinking of the moviegoer and Lancelot in particular, owe a lot to that, uh, to that first person narrator, which is something you don't see in O'Connor. You know, it's a way of actually distinguishing Percy from O'Connor. Um, so uh, Percy does first person narrative in those two novels, moviegoer and Lancelot, um, Love in the Ruins, and Thanatos Syndrome. And I think it's useful to, uh, to think about what, one thing he talks about in his essays, um, he, he likes that use of the first person voice because he likes the idea of setting out in the novels that he wrote to explore a predicament. Uh, he talked about the way that his novels, the novels he was writing in the second half of the 20th century were going to be novels that in some ways departed from the traditional or maybe the 19th century idea of what a novel was with plot, character, uh, understood the way, way that, say, Tolstoy would. Um, Percy, in, in a way it's helpful to think about his scientific training here, he, he wants to put a person in a situation and set out to explore that situation with the protagonist in a sense. This is what he says that he's doing uh, in his novels. And he actually uses language that suggests that he is finding his own way forward as he does so. He sets out to explore alongside the protagonist as they, they look for clues um, 
that sort of thing. Well, yeah, well, sure. I mean, so uh, you might want to say, why would you write novels? I mean, Percy says, because if you write theory, you're, you're in the study show camp, right? Uh, so novels... Uh, what do you mean by that, Peter, in the study uh, they're, 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 You're writing impersonally in terms of theory as if you could explain something that way. It's not that all science would have to be reductionist, but science tends to be reductionist. And uh, so you abstract from the particular person put in a, a predicament on, on, a, on a personal uh, journey with his or her own destiny. And so uh, uh, there's no such thing, Percy says, as an atheistic novelist. Or if there is one, that person is one heck of a bad novelist. So in some, he was a great, um, he, he and I differ on this, he was a great admirer of Sartre who wrote uh, novels that were officially atheistic, but uh, not so much because people were put in the predicaments not of their own making and, and all that. Uh, so uh, it's not even I. It's not you don't you don't you don't oppose study show by I think, you oppose study show. But I am a self conscious of a self in a particular situation. I'm a person who has to figure out what to do on some Wednesday afternoon. I'm a person in the modern world who's who's stuck with the in the modern, prosperous free world stuck with the uh, he says the hell of pure possibility. The fact is, I might be anything, and I uh, have no guidance except from engineers and what I can make myself to be, but I really can't engineer myself into something, someone who would be happy or, or not displaced. And uh, so, uh, uh, why did Percy write in such a way that he was not obviously a Catholic? And the answer is, uh, he, and especially Flannery O'Connor, had a very low opinion of uh, Catholic apologetics. I mean, uh, O'Connor even more than, uh, than, than, than Percy. That the, if, uh, the Catholic apologetics just preached to the converted, in effect. And the religious language had lost its meaning, was, it was exhausted. And so you have to, you have to find your way back <coughs> by, by describing the world in such a way that there is what's really true, what's empirically true room for a created being. So he talks about um, the experience of the goodness of gratuitousness of created being. Uh, this turns out to be very hard to experience now, not because it's not there. So, I mean, you know, the typical Southerner says, uh, the Northerner, and almost every Southern writer says this, Northern, and Rusty Ramson says this, uh, Northern writers uh, love humanity and, and Southerners love uh, particular people. And if you're a lover of humanity, you write essays because you can't have a very good novel about we are the world. Uh, uh, and so northern writers are all pantheists in some way. Uh, southern writers can't be pantheists, but in the absence of religion, they just, uh, the, the, uh, the, in the absence of either religion or stoicism, and stoicism is the experience of ruling, right? So as long as southerners have the experience of ruling, they were proud enough to be happy enough. And so the, you know, the only book I have in common with all my students is uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, right? But Atticus Finch, the only time in his life he seems to be happy is that brief experience of ruling, like doing the right thing, fending off the mob and all that. And we read Will Percy, uh, uh, that seems to be the only real time he is happy. And they, even though he wasn't such a warrior guy by nature, uh, the, the, the experience of ruling. And so when Southerners lost the proud experience of ruling, so that proud particularity of the, of the, of the aristocrat, the political leader, they became, they still were particular, they, but they became absurd leftovers. And uh, at least in Percy's novels, the only way out turned out to be uh, suicide. So the challenge is to take the Southern experience of particularity as truthful, but fill it up. And that's what the religion of the personal, relational, Trinitarian God does. Accounts for particularity, while at the same time accounts for universality. So the difference between, uh, like say, Thomas Aquinas and Maimonides is the real existence of particular beings and particular providence. So what Percy is trying to do is give content to what's true the real existence of particular beings and particular provenance. 
I was going to add, I, <clears throat> it seems to me he's also starting out, and particularly this shows up in some of his philosophical essays with the idea of, of Robinson Crusoe, of within the late modern world we are so bereft of authority and meaning and structure to our choices and of understanding you know, <clears throat> roles and, and where one fits in, that you, you, you really are in a place where you have to start over uh, and certainly not reinvent yourself but begin to rethink uh, the past in, in, in a way that it can actually speak to you in a, in a, as a living tradition. And so it seems that the novel, particularly the use of imagination within a novel to catch people and grab them and you know, really actually put this before them, um, I think also as well and think, thinking about the Cartesian aspect of, of Percy's writings and you know, Descartes being the modern philosopher that he's most concerned with in terms of, right, because I'm trying to prove the world through the inside out, which seems to distort it. It seems to make me autonomous. It leads me uh, apart, apart from particular people. It seems to me, it seems like I'm kind of floating and trying to figure the world out in some sort of geometrically precise way. But of course, that alienates me from myself. And the novel, in that sense, is particularly through the way the dialogues and through the way uh, language is used, which goes back to the, the semiotic uh, theory that he was working on. Language actually becomes the vehicle that discovered for truth in the character. So consciousness, there is a knowing with, and you see this in particular particularity, I think, with um, uh, the, the people that uh, the protagonist will meet, in particular with the women uh, who seem to receive truth uh, from the protagonist character, like Binks in the movie goer, I will do whatever you tell me. To do it. I don't think it's necessarily a, a sexist uh, statement that he's trying to make, but it is one that uh, in dialogue with someone else, in love, in communicability, uh, I could find the measure of my being. Uh, and so in that regard, there is some, there's like a, a beauty and truth in the novel through, uh, through uh, knowing with one another what we need to do together. And so uh, I think you also see this very clearly with the characters of Allison. Uh, and Barrett in the Second Coming, in particular, she is she's kind of like a female Robinson Crusoe as she breaks out of the asylum, uh, and she's what kind of a schizophrenic, and is uh, all sorts of mental problems, depressions, uh, etc. Struggles even to speak and to use language in a proper way. But what she's actually doing is she understands the power and uh, connectedness of words with reality, and is trying to achieve that effect. And of course, Barrett, although she sounds strange to him, he knows that she is a very authentic seeker. Uh, and of course, you know, how could you make that point uh, in the way you want to, in a very powerful way, in a philosophical essay, it seems to me. Moving beyond discursive argument is, is the point. Yeah. Peter, I want to pick up on your reference to science there. Uh, science really does seem to play a central role in Percy's novels in, in various ways, and, uh, and not always just negatively either, and, and yet uh, there is this you know, natural concern one might have for the kind of reductionist scientific view of human beings. If you reduce them to chemicals, you, you're, you're leaving out the self, and, uh, and that's, that's a real problem. So how do you see Percy uh, dealing with this question of science and what it both contributes and the way in which it may harm a modern man's uh, attempt to come to grips with himself. You know, I mean, one, the word science only, only means knowledge of the way things really are. And so it was well pointed out, um, science means, uh, consciousness means uh, knowing with, right? And so how to restore the relational dimension to empirical science. So it's not science that's reductionistic, but applying a method uh, to understand that's perfectly fine for understanding sub-human phenomena to human phenomena. But human phenomena are just as natural as sub-human phenomena. They, we're hardwired to be human beings. We're not, we're not mysterious leftovers, really. We're perfectly explicable differences in the cosmos, right? And uh, with knowing comes displacement. And so, I mean, to, to give you an, an Why example. Is that? Yeah. No, let me get me, but, but I mean, so that a, a, a great man once said to me, I like Walker Percy because he's just like Aristophanes. And this is not quite true, but it's more true than not. So, you, ever, you all read the plays of Aristophanes. Socrates is portrayed, you know, especially in the clouds as a self-forgetful scientist. Socrates understands everything but Socrates. And this criticism is so powerful that Plato assimilates it 
and has a Socrates who's especially concerned with who Socrates is. And then the method of Socrates changes from experimental natural science like fleece feet and gnats rumps and stuff like that uh, to the, the method of dialogue which is relational. Now but the difference between the poet Percy, poet in the generic sense of non-prosy, uh, non-scientific prosy, uh, and Aristophanes is, Aristophanes actually thought there, there was not a science that incorporated human beings. So you had impersonal nature and mysterious leftovers, which is why in a certain way Aristophanes is the first postmodern writer in the bad sense. Uh, the, the celebrator of uh, the comic human particularity, this absurd leftover in the cosmos and all that. But uh, what Percy tries to be is, is more like Socrates, but a, a Christian Socrates, because Socrates only reflected on himself as mind and not as person. So Percy says, scientists can abstract themselves from the world for uh, from large periods of time and enter a kind of Eden of self-forgetfulness where they know the world and kind of forget themselves. But no human being can do that all the time. So Percy talks about scientists having this re-entry problem. Periodically you have to come back and be with other people. And scientists are really bad at that. And they're really bad at that because their scientific method does not incorporate all their experiences. Uh, so you know, the physicist understands everything in the world but the physicist. Not the physicist, and it's like, like in ancient writing, you have like the philosopher. Uh, and so, or like, you know, when, when I see, a, you know, the physicist is like Sheldon Cooper or like, or something. Uh, but, uh, but there's no one, uh, there's no one in real life like Sheldon Cooper. I mean, all the guys want to have sex. There's no one in real life like Sheldon Cooper. Uh, but Sheldon Cooper is, is an exaggeration of the self-forgetfulness of the scientist, and really, it's a really good show, it's funny. Uh, so you have the guy Socrates isn't simply the philosopher, he's other stuff too. And so the, the character in the Republic is one step removed from the so-called historical Socrates. Well, Walker Percy, that, that step is unrealistic. Let's, let's describe the actual Socrates in a predicament who's not only a philosopher but has a, uh, a wife he doesn't like very much and he has kids who don't speak, can be kind of stupid and don't behave very well and all that. So what's wrong with say uh, platonic dialogue is unrealistic because it's not describing the actual guy in a predicament which is why the novel has to occur after St. Augustine which is describing actual persons and not types. So you can describe a philosopher, you can describe a physicist, but that's different from describing an actual person in a predicament who's a scientist some of the time, but is not a scientist all the time. And when he's a scientist, he's kind of diverted himself from his actual personal problems. So how can you have a science that incorporates the personal experiences of even Carl Sagan? And Percy says uh, it's a matter of understanding who we are as natural beings given the gift of language, to repeat myself, as a natural capability. So there's a natural reason why we're, we're leftovers. There's a natural reason we're on a search. And we're not on a search for the truth about the stars, or the truth, as Carl Sagan thought. We're not on a, a search for the truth about impersonal necessity, like Socrates might have thought. Our search is fundamentally and deeply relational and personal. And so Percy and Flannery O'Connor completely agree on this. Our search is to be perfectly transparent before another person, and that could only be to be personally transparent before God. And Flannery O'Connor, this is uh, unbelievably clear in good country people, where she wants to appear before someone just as she is, but it turns out wooden leg guy is not God. <laughs> For sure. Yes. One thing I wonder is, is about the accessibility of Percy to today's readers. Uh, I remember going to college from 67 to 71. And uh, at that time, existentialism was kind of a hot item, although it was pointed out to me that it was hot, especially at Catholic colleges, which picked up European things about you know, 30 years after the Europeans had done them and got tired of them. Uh, 
So existentialism was kind of hot. So you could, it was easy to imagine somebody, in a way, making some kind of connection with the kinds of people that appear in, uh, in Percy's novels, you know, where these people start out with this kind of alienation. But it seems to me that today, when I look at college students today, I don't see alienation. I, I see maybe people who maybe 10 or 15 years from now will be alienated. I don't know. But right now, I, I'm inclined more to see people who don't have the level of reflectiveness to be alienated. You know, there's, they, may, they may be alienated you know, s substantively, but they don't know it. You know, they're not kind of seeking and kind of confused and wondering what life's about. It's more like, hey, I want a job. You know, I want a, my video games. I want my sex, so whatever. So uh, do you think that Percy can actually ring a bell with uh, today's young people, that they, they have any kind of experience that's going to help them, you know, kind of identify or take seriously the kind of characters that Percy writes about? Um, I think I've actually, I, I've taught a number of Percy's novels, but, um, and I do them in literature classes with other novels, and, and that may be a different take um, than, um, than what I'm about to talk about. Because I've also used Percy's introduction to Lost in the Cosmos, those first 20 pages or so. Um, getting people to think about different types of self, which they identify with or not. And I find that that really holds up well. Um, you do have to explain some of the cultural references. You have to explain who Carl Sagan is. Um, there's, there's a reference to the KGB, which doesn't <laughs> hold up anymore, because it was published in 83, I believe, Lost in the Cosmos. Uh, but I find that that actually has worked extremely well. The kinds of questions that Percy poses in that, in that nonfiction work, Lost in the Cosmos, to, to get people thinking about um, types of self. And, and he just he gives some great thought experiments there, which get people to realize that um, it, it is harder to articulate what the self is and, it, and what its problems are. Uh, than it is to articulate what a common cold is and, and what the cure is for the common cold. He, he talks through that using his medical background somewhat. So I think that that holds up really well. And I'll also say that I think in a number of the novels, um, and this, I think this connects to some of Peter's comments, there are certain novels where the characters are scientists or working in applied science. So Thomas, uh, Dr. Tom Moore in two of the novels is a physician who's doing applied science. Um, but in many of the novels, you have characters who are consumers of, of technology, uh, and as we all are. We live in this world which is dominated by tech, uh, technology. And there's a way in which we experience the problems of the scientists that Peter just described vicariously. Um, and I, I think that, yeah, Percy, one problem that Percy's protagonists always have is they, they want to transcend the world and view the world as though through a, a lens, whether a microscope, a telescope, or a movie camera, a video camera. Uh, I think Percy's great at writing about that and seeing the problems, the problems with it. It's a Cartesian problem. Uh, and I think that we all can recognize that we are to some degree complicit in or, or affected by that, that sense of detachment from the world that's created by, um, by technology, at least potentially. So I, I think that that's very relevant to, to contemporary concerns. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I never uh, teach novels because it's not my uh, job. Uh, I've taught Lost in the Cosmos, and it works fine. But my students are overwhelmingly evangelical. And for evangelicals, the, the correction is somewhat different. And so you have the criticism of American students as being, you know, as Alan Bloom said, flat soul. They're no longer moved by love and death, which means uh, they're no longer even being capable of, be, capable of being angry at what they've been deprived of. They're just clever, competent specialists or achievatrons who want to get jobs, only move by productivity. And you could say, I mean, what evidence for this would be is the productivity, productivity majors rule in American colleges and universities like they never have before. There are fewer and fewer liberal arts majors. Some liberal arts colleges keep the liberal arts brand for the brochure. There are actually the liberal arts disciplines been emptied of content. So all that's going on, uh, I think, is true. 
uh, on the one hand. On, on the other hand, uh, you know, it's, young people really are still moved by love and death, or at least love. Uh, they still are, you know, you know, rock music. Bloom, Bloom was completely wrong, not completely wrong, somewhat wrong, a lot rock music uh, because he missed the anger. He missed rap and hip hop, uh, even Adele. Ah, uh, not he, the reasons why he missed Adele, but the uh, <laughs> yeah, she can sing. Okay, uh, but uh, but uh, so there is a uh, there, 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 it's, it's not true that young people don't have the existential experiences anymore. Being existential is not cool anymore. Uh, the beatniks uh, talking about alienation and all that. I kind of wish existentialism would come back, right? But existentialism has been whipped by neuroscience, uh, neuroscience, scientific explanations of everything. So people th have a, a lower, you know, a lower opinion of existentialism than ever. For example, you know, psychology about which I know nothing, so I speak with great authority. I mean, uh, Percy makes uh, this important point: Freud and Jung with all their shortcomings, are much better than anything that came after them. They're better than operant conditioning, uh, all kinds of self-helpy things. And it used to be humanistic psychology was kind of vulgarized existentialism, like Leo Basaliga, who he makes fun of. But, that, but humanistic psychology has become so low-level and sappy, that's not, there's, not, there's none of that left anymore. Uh, so, uh, so uh, but it doesn't mean that kind of, you know, but you have to admit if you took a psychology course and you had an existentialist psych, uh, psychologist, that guy would rule the department. He would have hundreds and hundreds of people in his class. And the other kind of like boring experimental psychology where let's do undergraduate research about things that are of no importance at all. Uh, how do I agree that the, the, one of the most evil movements in the country right now is undergraduate research? Because you, you know, so you might, you know, my, my, you know I, I do a lot of stuff that passes for research. Uh, so my provost comes to me and says, why don't you engage students in your research? I say, you, I use students as look stuff up and proofreaders, but I don't publish with students. He said, well, why? I said, well, they don't know anything. Uh, <laughs> and, I, and it can be as smart as the devil, but, it's, you know, but you, you, the idea that science has no past, this is like talking about your reductionistic empirical science, that you don't even know where, like to talk about Sheldon Cooper, the paradigm of your science came from. You just know you got this tiny little research question about something no one in the right mind would care about. But if you do that, then vanity kicks in and you'll get your name in some journal no one reads. Uh, uh, so, I mean, you have all these tendencies, but, but you know, I, I really think that it's self-denial, diversion, young people aren't so different. And, but uh, they talk like they're different. Uh, so actually, it's much better to teach at Belmont Abbey or at Union College or something like this because the students know at least one book is true and they're so in love with that book they're willing to acknowledge the possibility that other books might contain some of the truth you most need to know and uh, so uh, I just don't you know I'm, I'm a Percy and, and so I think there's love in the ruins even if we blow up the planet if there's any life left things will come back uh, more, or like, more or less the way they did so the, the character in, at the end of the second uh, there's a character in the second Space Odyssey in Lost in the Cosmos called Marcus Aurelius Schuyler, uh, who, who is a, a stoic who fakes being a ruler. He likes to play the unflappable uh, captain. And at the end of the novel, he is not a Christian. He, he, there's this cave with an opening where uh, the abbot uh, is saying mass and, and, and all that, and he sits with his uh, disbelievers outside the the, the, the uh, I forget the, the, the you know the, the people who are obviously skeptics, and so they they like Chris Christopherson Sunday morning coming down because for you know there's no 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 time more empty than uh, than Sunday morning if you don't believe, but they have this kind of irony. Uh, about about things that they didn't have before and so this guy says Jesus Christ here we go again like all of the us versus them politics comes back all the dumb things people do come back so I 
that's what I think. All the dumb things come back. Brave new worlds, don't worry about that. Uh, there are all kinds of things to worry about, but not that. Uh, we'll remain human uh, in a Cartesian ghostly time where in some ways we're more free than ever, in some ways more miserable than ever. But, you know, with Pascal, I say, thank God for the misery. That means religion can stay in business. Yeah, I, I was going to say, it seems like I've been thinking that, about this as well. It seems, you know, something you alluded to, I think, is David Brooks's uh, famous article from maybe 10 years ago, Organization Kid. So you have, on the one hand, uh, an attempt to achieve and, and be, be everything, and that's the way you understand your collegiate education. But, of course, that's really a product, I think, Education is usually related to the broader ends of the society itself, and we seem to recognize no thick truth within our society about man and man's dignity as relationship to God. So it necessarily stands to reason that you're going to you know, reduce or retract the scope of humanity's education or the notion that you come to university to maybe investigate some big questions. And that seems to me increasingly lost. And of course, humanities professors have, have made their disciplines themselves somewhat silly. Uh, and, and I've kind of pushed them off with all of the various theories and ideologies that consume them. I mean, humanities faculty, when you look at surveys, are usually the most left-wing or caught up in various ideologies. The same places are business schools or the hard sciences. So I think that's, <clears throat> that's operative. So there might be a difficult time of students you know, being, being able to ask the, the right questions about themselves and about, about their place within the cosmos. It seems also, uh, I think is uh, important, is uh, and maybe this is a Marxist point, so I'll, I'll be careful, but the uh, sense of the decentralized modes of communication and production with the digital economy, I think have given people more time than ever uh, a way to think about themselves as productive beings apart from any real sense of leisure uh, or, um, uh, or, or just you know, being at home and, and thinking and pondering and reflecting because... Can I get a form of self-help? Yeah, yeah. All right. So according to, to Pascal, the main source of our misery is our inability to sit quietly alone in our room. When was the last time any of you guys sat with no, no computer, no iPad, iPod, any other eye thing? How many of you have sat alone in your room quietly and happily without having to have some kind of diversion as quickly as possible? So that's, that's the, kind of the absence of leisure, just being okay. You know. So for Percy, you know, I'm gonna sound, the, the hardest thing in the world is to be in love in the present. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah no, no, that, I mean, that's, that's definitely uh, where I was going with that. But also, it, it seems to me, uh, there are you know, no sufficient guides. Uh, th that's a problem. Also, I think with Percy's literature itself, it lends itself, uh, I think, more towards men. I mean, I, I've wondered if that is kind of a barrier. Uh, it seems as well, I, I've wondered how uh, a lot of kids outside of, say, the New South would, would there be a barrier there as well with what he's describing um, and also with, with kind of the, the interaction between the old one and the new, would that be kind of off-putting? But I, I think the scientific essays and the essays on language and philosophy remain, uh, particularly I mean, if we think this is true, if we think this is an accurate description of man and man's problems, it seems to me that that never goes away, as Peter was describing. But at the same time, I do think, uh, particularly with, with the generation we're seeing, the polls about what they value. Uh, so we have, it's an increasingly secular, uh, secularizing in the country overall, but particularly amongst younger people. And you have to wonder, you know, what, is that, what does that mean for the future? And particularly, and you stack that with the increased economic insecurity going on, uh, the turn towards, we, we actually now have younger people actually wanting government to be involved in their lives in a big, big way which is depressing, it seems to me, it all kind of forces this question of the flattening out of a democracy overall, and so maybe the larger battle uh, over, you know, over time is really to, uh, with, with Tocqueville, to retain the local aristocracies, uh, both of the soul and of institutions that elevate people higher. Of course, that's what you're trying to do, but I mean, I think uh, overall, but I, I don't think Percy would be as removed or incapable to speak to the to present generation. I'll pick up on your radical suggestion that men and women may be different. And that, for example, that it may be easier for men, perhaps, to kind of grip, come to grips with the question that uh, questions, the situations that Percy describes. And I wonder, is that partly because men are more prone to this kind of scientism, you know, the, sci you know, the objectification of things, whereas women have a I think partly because of their connection, their physical connection with reproduction, have a kind of uh, openness to particularity 
that perhaps men may lack, and that, that may explain some of the difference uh, uh, in how they might react to Percy's writing. It seems to me clearly, uh, I'll say this, in the novels uh, with regards to sex, it's, it's almost as if, uh, with the sexual act, women are grounding in yeah. the sense of uh, women ground men who are prone to engage in all manner of scientific exploits. And it's, you know, actually, if you think about in Love in the Ruins, uh, Ted and Tanya, uh, uh, you know, there's it's clearly the case. Uh, he's imminent before his wife. He's, he's a scientist. That's his, he's a graduate student in science. Uh, and he's having all manner of problems. He's abstracted from himself. We learned this from the application of the ontological lapsometer. You know, and he prescribes this course for him of running through the swamp for six miles as a way to come back to himself, to stop missing himself. And when he does that, it seems to me there's, there's this you know, act of grounding with uh, his wife. He's finally able to be with her uh, in the marital embrace. Uh, and this is kind of like a culmination of things that, that, that uh, Moore is working for in the lapsometer. Yeah. Something similar in the Thanatos syndrome too, as well. At least, I don't, I don't know whether Percy pulls it off as well, but but it's clear that Lucy plays for Tom Moore a, a kind of grounding uh, role in his life. There, I mean, you talked uh, uh, in in some of your work about the question of marriage in in Percy, and uh, how you know how does Percy look at at marriage in his his work? Well. I, I think for Percy, it's kind of, um, I mean, even if, you know, you ask the question, uh, you know, Percy talked about uh, the use of pornography, and, and I think we can say with regard to the disorder of marriage, these are symptoms. These are larger symptoms of, of personal decay, of the intrapersonal splits he describes with Cartesianism, in that we no longer are able really to understand love and the deep meaning and purpose of love and how it calls us out of ourself. And so even Eros, in a way, can become perfecting. Uh, of ourselves when it's finally joined to another person and we actually see ourselves you know, perfecting them and loving them in the way that they require and need. But of course, right, if, if primarily what you understand yourself, if you understand yourself more as a, a ideological being who is trying to prove reality from the inside out, you are in effect using language uh, and tools, procedures to constitute reality through your will. Um, then necessarily stands to reason those sorts of pre-liberal institutions like the family, like say local government, all these things that require a gift of yourself with maybe the payback coming much later, there's a longer return, are going to become distorted and misshaped. And I think you see that in particularly in Love in the Ruins and the Second Coming, I think this is evident, uh, and particularly with the failed marriages with Tom Moore and Doris, and then uh, later there's, there's a marriage between Tom and Ellen and then also in the Second Coming. Uh, Barrett has something of a failed marriage, I think, with Marion, but of course, he, as he describes himself, uh, he's, he's, he's I, I, I wake up and I learn that perhaps I have missed my entire life. You know, why have you missed your entire life? It seems that you, can know, you can't really place yourself anywhere because of these distorted self-understandings that you have. And of course, marriage, it seems to me, and a lot of other institutions will just kind of follow suit. Uh, it seems to me if Percy were here and we asked him the question of same-sex marriage, he would say something something similar. Don't focus, these are symptoms. They're going to have a tremendous impact, I think, on our society and our law, but uh, so, you know, what, what's most important is uh, you know, what's going on over here. So kind of the way Austrian economists would look at 2008 and say, don't focus on the bust, look at the boom, that's where your problem started. I think similar with marriage, we can, we can look back and say the sexual revolution itself is, you know, Robbie George has talked about this as well, the sexual revolution is a Cartesian moment. I'm a desiring self inside, and my body is just a point of contact with the other person. But that, that introduces all sorts of problems. One last question. Uh, we're talking about this wonderful writer, and we're, of course, we're doing that because we want to stimulate a new generation of students and others to, uh, t to take a look back at him. Uh, where would you have people start reading Walker Percy? It's, it's hard to say. Um, it really, you know, depends on the individual. When I think about Percy uh, and his continuing interest in physicians, you know, he'd say the physician has to know each patient individually to, <laughs> to diagnose and to prescribe. So different people have different tastes. Um, and so, you know, I think for most, uh, for many English majors, I might prescribe the moviegoer, uh, but for uh, for others, I might prescribe Lost in the Cosmos uh, or, 
or Percy, Percy's collected essays, um, posthumously collected essays, Signpost in a Strange Land. I think that those works of nonfiction and the essays in Signpost in a Strange Land or Lost in the Cosmos as a whole are, are great places to get a sense of his, of his thought. I'm going to answer that question and ask myself too. So Walker Percy has this one interview where he asks himself all the questions. <laughs> and it turns out, it turns out he, he knew the answers to most of them. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the difference between men and women, which was an excellent point, is men are more abstracted or, as Harvey Mansfield says, more manly, and women are more uh, realistic, uh, uh, or that is more attached to particular people as whole people. From that point of view, men should start with Lost in the Cosmos, or The Last Gentleman, and women should start with The Movie Goer. Uh, the question is, which part of Walker Percy is uh, not so relevant to us today? And the answer would be his explanation of totalitarianism, because this is one thing young people do not believe ever really existed. It's one of the most amazing things in the world. The world was full of uh, totalitarians one day, and then the next day there were none except like in American universities or something, but, uh, <laughs> but then only in theory because the communist American other than the nicest guys otherwise. Uh, the, uh, and then uh, the one would be uh, uh, the, the Thanatos syndrome is all about uh, pornography or all about child molesting. And, um, and uh, where does Percy get his view of, the man Percy get his view of uh, pornography and child molesting? And the answer is from the woman, Flannery O'Connor, who says, pornography is pure sentimentality. That is the detachment of the bare act from the hard purposes connected with birth and death. And, uh, but pornography isn't quite abstracted because, uh, so it, uh, it's not quite abstract because the, the continued existence of the physical act proves you're not a ghost. Because as Percy says in, in Lost in the Cosmos, You've never seen a ghost with an erection. But the idea you can detach the erection from the natural purposes connected with the erection is much less likely women would make that mistake, which is why safe sex is sort of a male illusion. Well, I, I, I um, don't know how to follow that I, one. I, <laughs> I, you know, I was thinking it, it, would, it would obviously depend. I think uh, with younger people, the deep introspection that they've always been encouraged to engage in for you know, rather shallow reasons, you would want to start with the Last Up Help book. I think that would be a, a natural opening. Um, just because of The Last Gentleman is my favorite book because it's the most deeply autobiographical book. And I think a, a lot of us can relate to the idea of running from something. And that's what he's really trying to do in the sense of, you know, as he, you know, he moves back south, he's actually coming back to the source of his, of his discontent and woe. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, that's, that's the source of a lot of his problems, I think. And he's also trying to engineer his life for the good, uh, for his own good, as he conceives it. So I think in that regard, you know, it, it would be a book I would probably uh, tell people to read uh, as well. But I can't really improve upon what Peter has said in terms of, in terms of recommendations <laughs> and point why. Well, again, my name is Chris Wolf, co-director of the Thomas International Center. We've been talking here about the great novelist Walker Percy, and we hope this is a stimulus to many of you to go out and read him yourself and to, to benefit from his wonderful insights. Thank you all for participating today.